so myself and Heather are marine ecologists um, in the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences at, at Newcastle University. And we're going to share with you some work today that we've been doing in terms of ecology field work. Um, but just to note, we have used a, a similar approach to this with some of our lab work as well. Um, but as we are field ecologists, um, primarily we wanted to, to talk to you about, about what we've been doing with our students. So within the biosciences disciplines, um, you know, we undertake quite a lot of field work um, within our, our degree programmes. We can define the field as a quite broad um, concept. It can be really any arena or zone where we are undertaking supervised learning, but without sort of outside of those four walls of a, a traditional classroom setting. In the biosciences, these can take different forms. So it could be a compulsory or a voluntary or an optional um, session. It can be you know, a couple of hours, a half day, a full day. It can be residential, either within the UK or overseas. We do work within sort of field um, environments, but also as well, we might take students to on industrial visits into museums and places like that. This sort of field teaching is really, really important because it allows students to develop a whole range of um, subject specific skills. So things like in the ecology discipline, we teach students about organisms and ecosystems, but also those broader skills that are really important in, in any employment they go into. So things like um, knowledge acquisition, research skills, decision making, team working, but also they're really crucial for providing opportunities for those social interactions as well. Um, not only social interactions with their peers, but social interactions with the colleagues and you know, PhD students, demonstrators who are supporting them. And that's been demonstrated to improve um, sort of their satisfaction with their degree program, but also enhance recruitment and retention as well. When we are designing field teaching, um, you know, this will be a, a cycle that's familiar to many of you, um, but we think about our field teaching in relation to, to Kolb's learning cycle. And what we're looking for here is that um, sort of iterative process where we provide students with that preparatory phase. So we prepare them with briefings ahead of going into the field. They actually do what, what we're expecting them to do, hopefully, within the field in that doing phase. Actually, it's that reflective phase where often that learning is taking place. And then what we try and do is build on their field experiences by then giving them a, another opportunity to undertake that, that um, preparation and the doing before again reflecting back on that whole cycle. When we're thinking about field teaching within our degree programmes, um, we teach marine ecology. And so we can use the research teaching nexus to sort of um, situate our, our field teaching within this. For those of you who are not familiar with this, it runs along two axes. So we have the vertical axes, which relates to student activities with a progression from the bottom, where it's very much um, sort of students as an audience, through to the top where they are participants in their own programmes. We then have the horizontal axis, um, and there we're seeing a switch in emphasis from left to right, where again, we're using research as content within our delivery, through to students engaging in processes of research and problem solving. And we can frame our field work activities within this framework. So in the beginning of our degree programme at first year, we do practical skills where students go out and observe environments there, you know, get into grips with these new, new places that they've, they've heard about in lectures, and they're developing those observational and sort of inquiry skills. When we get up into second year, level five, that's when students are starting to design their own experiments. They're thinking about their own data collection. They're thinking about those experimental protocols and how they undertake and analyze um, that data collection. Also in, in our second year, we do um, sort of additional work where we're getting students to think about the not only doing of the field work, but we're, we're developing those research project skills. And then that builds up into their final year when they go into their, their research project um, and they undertake their own research project as an independent researcher, but also they do group projects in relation to our overseas field courses as well. So we get them working in small groups in overseas field courses. So you can see that our, our field practicals are, are really well embedded within our degree programmes. And obviously in the last few years, we had a little bit of a problem in that we couldn't necessarily take our students out into the field um, in the marine environments, both locally in the northeast um, on our research vessel or on those residential field courses, both in the UK and overseas. 
So we had to come up with a little bit of a solution for this. Um, quite recently, there has been sort of a lot of work in this, this area um, around sort of virtual resources being developed. And you know, while we're recognising that that physical presence in the field is really important, those virtual resources have been used to augment that physical field work. When we're thinking about virtual resources, we wanted to retain those, those key skills and key approaches. So the observation, the data gathering, the problem solving. But instead of doing that in person in the field, we can use different computer generated approaches. Virtual field work is quite well established in many disciplines, but not so much in, in the biosciences and not so much in the marine sciences. There's a lot of really good evidence and, and good practice from things like geology um, and geography, but it wasn't something much that we knew about or there was a lot of experience within our, our discipline. So we hit this point where we couldn't go out, we couldn't take our students into the field and we couldn't do any of the um, any of the experiences that we were used to doing with them. So we really hit a point where we didn't know if we could create a virtual environment where we could take our students out into the field. And we didn't really understand at this point how a virtual environment might work. And Sarah and I have both been thinking about technology enhanced learning for a while, and we've both been thinking about that virtual provisional for a while. So we had some ideas of what we might be able to do, but at this point we really didn't know how we were gonna do this or um, how we were gonna develop a, a meaningful experience for our students to conduct that field work from the luxury of their um, bedrooms, accommodation, wherever it is that they might have been at the time. So prior to lockdown, we'd both attended some workshops and we both really thought about that virtual provision. We'd had lots of conversations and we discussed the art of the possible and we kind of both went on this very um, probably steep learning curve to really think about how we might do this. And, you know, I'm the first one to say that I'd gone off into the, the world of sci-fi and thought we could do all of these really amazing things and we had to ground ourselves a little bit more back into what actually was possible during that time. We'd been recommended a program called ThingLink, but we couldn't quite figure out how ThingLink worked at the time. But when we spent a little bit of time investigating ThingLink, and we're now all very um, common with using tools like Microsoft Teams, we actually realised that this was a match made in heaven and that ThingLink worked really well in Microsoft Teams. And actually, it was very easy to then start to think about how we might develop um, some virtual content using ThingLink, which we could then make readily available to our students through their virtual and learning environments and using tools tools like Microsoft Teams to support them. ThingLink is really easy to use and so once we had solved the problem of how to take a 360 image, which I know that sounds daft now, but at the time that was, you know, that was our first hurdle. We didn't have the kit that we needed in order to actually capture what we needed to capture from um, the environments that we were working in. But once we'd taken that 360 degree image, we then realized that actually it was a very simple case of adding tags to those images. And by using the tags, you can see on this slide here that we can add a range of different content to each of those tags. So content from websites, but also text labels, media, videos, you can link that through to all of the different types of Microsoft programs. So we could have quizzes and forms within that virtual environment as well. So we could really interact with our students as we moved through the virtual environment. Um, and what we really want to do is just show you that now. So I'm just going to play a video. Okay, so now we really wanted to show you what our virtual environments are like and take kind of a tour around um, the different habitats that we've looked at and really show you how we've conducted um, the field trips that we did within our virtual environment. So here, our first virtual environment is on the rocky shore at Cullercoats Bay. Um, you can see here that we've got a full 360 degree view of the shore and we can look down at the rocks in front of us or we can move around to different parts of that shore. You'll see lots of tags on the shore with the common feature that we've used throughout all of our virtual habitats. Our little magnifying glass here, they link through to different parts of the rocky shore so we can explore different types of habitats. We have some information in our yellow tags and um, specific species that we find in our green tags. And we can change these depending on the practical that we're doing. So for, for example, in some instances, we had a practical looking at the taxonomy. So we wanted species to identify the species that they were seeing. So we changed these slightly, we put in some keys and we removed the species identif identification um, from the actual tag. One of the things that we can do in the rocky shore is we can collect quantitative information. So we can actually get the students to collect data as if they were in the field themselves. And if we click on our red tags here, you can see quadrats um, where they can count the number of 
barnacles that they see within these quad charts and create themselves a spreadsheet to then start to analyze and answer some questions that we're asking within the practical. It really allows us to meet those learning outcomes that we would do if we were in the field. If we head into some of these different environments, we can go and explore different parts of the shore. So for example, here we're down in the low shore, looks very different from the mid shore and gives students the opportunity to see the different species that they would find in this particular habitat. Um, one of the things we can also do is click on some um, videos and they can really start to appreciate what that habitat under the water looks like as well. So we're not just looking at the entire here, we're trying to give them a full appreciation of the different habitats that they'll find in that area. Um, we can link straight back into the midshore as well. So if we go up this way, we go back into that central landing place. Um, and we can explore different habitats. So for example, here we can go into the rock pool. Um, and we created a whole practical around rock pool habitats for our stage two students. And to give you an example of what that rock pool habitat looked like, here we are again on that midshore landing area for Cullercoat Bay. And you can see here now some different coloured magnifying glasses. And these will take us to different rock pools in the area. So here now you have a viewpoint where you're in the water under the rock pool and you can see this is a video recording and you can hear sounds that you would hear in the rock pool to so the different species that you would see and hear here. And we can also collect quantitative data again so we have some quadrat data in here that students can have a look at, interact with and collect species information from those quadrats. In addition to the rocky shore, we also went out and explored other habitats um, across the northeast region. And these are linked to practicals that we would normally do with our students. So the last example I'm going to give you here is of an estuarine environment. But we also had a look at some um, salt marshes and some sand dunes as well. And we have um, models of those particular areas that our students interacted with. So here you can see an overview of the estuary. We had an introductory video on the red tags down here about practical session that we were going to do um, and the activities that we wanted the students to conduct. We had some information shots here and the yellow tags and then these green tags really take us through to the different parts of that estuarine environment. So we can go here to site one which is at the mouth of the estuary really interfacing with the open sea and we can really get an appreciation of what that habitat is like. We popped some videos in here so specifically on how we collected data in these areas um, and these would be the activities that the students would do if they were actually in the shore environment. I'm not going to play that, but that basically takes you through the methodology that we would have used. And then we linked that to, um, again, some quadrat data here so that the students could actually um, collect that information, those data points that they would collect if they were in the field. We had surface quadrats and those in, in the sediment, so they had a comparison between the two. Um, you can then move from site one all the way through to site two and then site three and four and five and move up the estuary and you can really start to see how the habitat changes in the different parts of the estuary environment. So you can look forward here to site one um, and you can head back that way if you want to um, or you can carry on down the estuary to sites three and four um, and explore the estuary environment in full. So that's a very quick whistle stop tour through um, some of our virtual field trips, but we hope that you can gain an appreciation from that of um, the types of interactions that our students have um, when exploring these different um, virtual environments. So we ended up with a range of different virtual environments and the students could go and collect data within those habitats and they could conduct the practicals in the way that we wanted to, them to conduct the practicals as if they were actually present in person with us. But it was really important for us to also gain some information from the students and find out what they actually thought about doing fieldwork in that way. Um, not just for their provision under COVID, but also thinking about the future and thinking about how we were going to use some of these resources as we went forward. So you can see here from these graphs, um, very rudimentary, but they found the useful, they found the synchronous field trip um, useful and they, they liked that, they thought it was good. Um, it's important to say that whilst we were running these field trip with field trips with them, we actually did that synchronous online with them. So we ran a Zoom session alongside um, their use of the virtual provision. So we would be there available with them as if we were available in the field with them so that they could actually go and conduct that and troubleshoot any problems they were having by coming to us whilst we were online with them. 
They think that they made good progress while they were taking part of the field work and they thought that it was a good online replacement for, you know, going into the field under the restrictions that we were facing at the time. We also allowed them to give us free text comments because it was really important to find out what they liked about the virtual field trip. And this was really interesting. We we hoped and we, we received some feedback from them that they found that it was easy to navigate. They thought that it was a good delivery and restrictions and that it was immersive, informative, interactive. This was all brilliant. This was exactly what we wanted to hear from them because it meant that we'd, you know, provided them with something that was meaningful. What was really interesting to us is that some students actually thought that it was that good that they saw things or experienced things in that virtual environment that they might have actually missed had they been in the field. And when we spoke to those students, you know, they said things to us like, well, you know, you're always messing about when you go in the field, you're having a chat with your mates, you know, you're having a good time. You're not necessarily paying attention in the way that we would like them to pay attention had they been doing that in person. So this then got us thinking about what we might do going forwards using the resources that we've created. And just to give you an idea about some of the free text comments that they said, this is just to give you an example of some of the things that they actually said um, whilst we were um, gathering that feedback from them. So it was really positive and it was really nice to hear this from them. So going forwards and thinking about the fact that the students are actually gaining more from a virtual environment than we thought they would, and, and it was quite surprising to us, we then started to think about the future and about how we might blend some of that virtual provision with our present in-person teaching to try and enhance that experience. So we're really thinking about um, not replacing our present in-person field trips. We don't think that that virtual provision is a replacement or should ever be a replacement. You get so much from, from going into the field. And um, what we really want to think about is how we can use it to enhance their experience. So thinking about that preparatory phase that Sarah discussed earlier, thinking about how we can fully prepare them to go in the field, allow them to become familiar with habitats that they may not have experienced before, but also post in-person field trip as well. So once they've conducted those field trips, you know, can they revisit these virtual um, resources to really consolidate that learning and remind themselves what they've done and really pick up those elements that they may have missed had they been when they've been in the field. We're into sort of week five now of our teaching and we've been doing field work with our students present in person and actually we're already seeing the benefits from being able to use um, our our virtual provision alongside that present in person provision. An example of that was sort of in week two one of my stage two students came to me um, at the very beginning of a field trip and said you know, hi Heather, I, you know, had a bit of an accident during induction week, I was quite drunk and I've um, uh, dislocated my ankle. It's a little bit better, uh, I'm going to try the field work, um, but if, it, if it's really bad, can I, can I sit this one out? <laughs> and we were on monsoonal rain on that particular day, so I said, I tell you what, why don't you head back into the lab, we have the virtual provision, it's on canvas, you've seen it already, you can actually work alongside your group in the field and conduct that practical session virtually. When your group come back in from the field, you can go through the process and fill in the forms and, and the, the, the exercise that you would need to do, but you can use the virtual resources to do that. And it worked really well. And he went back into the lab, he conducted the field trip independently, and then he came back together with his group um, and completed the exercises that they needed to do um, within that group work, which was brilliant. So that's just one example that, you know, actually this blending of the virtual resources with that present in person, Teaching is really starting to now enhance the provision that we can provide for our students um, under those circumstances, which is great. But we wanted to build on this and we didn't just want to stick with the virtual environments that we created. And we wanted to think about what else we could bring in to really enhance that experience further. And something that we've been thinking about for a long time is not just virtual reality, but also augmented reality. And we're thinking about the Pokemon Go of the rocky shore of the marine environment. What can we do with some of this technology to really enhance what our students are doing in the field? And we've had a project running which has allowed us to do proof of concept, really, and it's right in the initial stages. And I'm hopefully going to share with you some of the practice that we've done over the past few weeks, um, hot off the press, to really show you how we're now further developing developing this. And this is essentially going to be our COVID keepers. It's that, you know, pre and post fieldwork with the virtual environment, but also bringing in this AR um, to further enhance what's happening there. 
So one of the things that our students do, um, as Sarah mentioned at that very beginning, um, journey within their university careers, they're going out and they're observing what they're seeing. Um, and part of that observation is explorations. It's about fostering that curiosity and really exploring the different habitats that we want them to become familiar with. So we have a practical session where we um, take them out onto the shore and they have to find as many different species as they possibly can. Um, during that session. We then bring these back into the laboratory and they start to work through um, some taxonomic keys to start to identify these organisms. There's a QR code there and you can all scan that QR code hopefully and hopefully you will have an augmented reality marine species um, that you will be able to view from the comfort of your own home. So what we did is we used some technology, we used a program called Clone, which allowed us to scan um, some marine species. And then we used a program called MyWebR, which allowed us to create an augmented reality model. Um, and we did this for some of the more cryptic species that they might not find if they were looking in that shore environment. When we went out last week, it was quite a stormy day, you know, and um, we have much more concentration when the weather is is um, amenable to us being out there. So we, we've scanned some of these cryptic species, we created an augmented reality model for that. And when we brought them back into the laboratory, alongside that identification of the organisms that they found, they could also scan the QR codes and um, look at the augmented reality species and identify them in the same way that they were doing with their um, species that they'd found on the shore. And we've got some ideas about how we might develop this further and actually gamify that experience on the Rocky Show a little bit more. Um, but this was our first step into trying that. Everybody happy if I move on? If I take you away from the QR code, the species will disappear. So it's a marked um, AR experience. And again, we wanted to know what our students thought. And when we asked them about their ease of use and the enjoyment, they, they found that it was easy to use. They enjoyed looking at the 3D models and they thought that it was a fun experience, which was great. But more than that, we wanted to know something about their engagement, about their skills development and about their understanding um, of um, looking at species in this way. And they felt that they were more engaged um, when doing a combination of present in person and AR. They felt that they were able to identify the augmented organisms as if they were looking at them in real life. And they felt that actually the experience improved their understanding of the taught material. So it was really consolidating that learning, which is great, which is exactly what we wanted um, them to say. They weren't primed. Um, so that we can think about how we're going to go forward and develop this, this further. And we really want to now investigate that markless um, augmented reality so that we can actually have... Um, some hunting for augmented species on the shore alongside looking for those um, real species and thinking about scoring their experiences and how well they've done at searching for different species while they're out there. And there's obviously um, lots of different, um, different types of practical sessions that we can apply this type of work to. Everything that we've shown you today has been coastal, it's been near shore, it's been very easy to access. Part of the reason for that is, you know, under restrictions, we could only access those coastal areas. But we have the kit now, we have the technology and we've got some methodology that we can use to hopefully start to explore some of those more remote marine habitats and really bring our students into that remote marine world that we never would be able to take them to uh, whilst they're studying with us. So we're hoping that this is going to open up, um, open up that world of possibility for us a little bit more as well. Okay, so just to finish then, um, we're really keen, as, as Heather said, to sort of think about the capabilities of what we can do with this going forward. And I think in terms of, of preparing students for field work, there's been a, a body of research that you know, demonstrates that students have that anxiety about undertaking field work, about knowing what, not what to wear, what to take with them, about going into environments for the first time. And so we're going to continue to use these going forward in our pre-field work briefings so that students have the opportunity not to do the work before we get there, but just to familiarise themselves with the environment, know what the access points look like, you know, think about the where they're actually going to work. I think this has really strong implications for our sort of inclusivity um, and, you know, making sure that students can feel confident going into those virtual environments. I think the proactive design allows students who may not be able to engage in all practical sessions um, in person to do so. You know, we schedule our, our practical work to, to coincide with the tides, um, 
And sometimes students, for a variety of reasons, just can't come on on that session on that day. And up until now, we've, you know, they've missed out. We've never had the opportunity to go back and do that again with them. Um, but by having this as an online resource, by giving them the tools to actually then go and collect their data, um, they can do that, you know, alongside their classmates. So they're, they're not missing out on that authentic experience. And I think those activities really allow us to think about the sort of active student participation. Um, it allows us to think about how we can embed this informative assessment and give students the opportunity to go through that learning cycle so that they can do the preparation, they can do the doing, they can do the data collection, they can do the reflection. And even if they've been in the field, they've experienced that in-person delivery, they can go back to the environment. And if they have missed something because you know, they got excited with their friends or they were messing around or there was just so much for them to take in, they can come back to these um, virtual environments and consolidate that learning and make sure that they're getting a full experience from this. So just to finish then, just to, to thank you um, for inviting us along today. Thank you for your time um, and we're happy to, to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Heather and Zara. Um, Zara, you, you've actually answered most of the questions in the chat already, so there's nothing for me to do. <laughs> um, I obviously thought this was brilliant when I saw this presented, and I had a chat with Heather about some of the, the possibilities of moving away from a, an ecology background sort of into the lab, and I got a little bit excited and started looking at these invisible drones and everything, and started thinking about how you could fly a drone around a lab and make it a 360 experience. Then I realised how much it will cost and the university would never ever pay for it. So <laughs> my ideas back a little bit. Um, I know I know the answer to this, but um, just for everybody else out there with um, thing links and stuff, what's the, the sort of cost associated with that? Yeah, so you we have a free free account. Um, if you've got a Microsoft account, you can have a free account um, on ThingLink. The problem with the free account is that um, you only get a certain number of views a month. Um, we, I think it was a thousand views a month, um, is something like that. And because we were using this in several different um, arenas, you know, even for one practical, our, our one cohort is about 67 students. We were quite rapidly exceeding that um, view limit. Um, that meant that you could still view um, the materials online in ThingLink, but what it meant is you couldn't view them within our um, virtual learning environment, which is Canvas. It was quite important for us to make sure that um, everything was in one place. We didn't really want students to be switching between different different tools. So we upgraded to an educational account. Sarah will correct me if I say the wrong thing here, but I think it's about £120 a year. So it's not um, too expensive, it's not onerous at all, and they're actually brilliant, they're so supportive and um, really helpful. That gave us 20 user accounts on there, so um, individual people could create content within ThingLink for different modules, um, up to 20 people, and that gave us unlimited views a month, which is great, and you, know, you can track those stats. Um, as students are using the resources that we've created and you know they really do spike around around assessment periods around um, when the practicals are running and tail off either side of that so we know that they're using them pre and post session as well which is, which is great yeah I agree with what David just said there so it sounds like great value I mean that's an absolute bargain yeah. compared to some of the other things that you do you think there's any risk that you're going to get students who are going to look out the window and go oh it's hammering down I'm just going to do <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll be honest with you I yeah I did think that you know and when, when we delivered this under COVID on the day that we were supposed to go out it was actually chucking it down it wasn't a very nice day and both Sarah and I said to them you know we we're actually really pleased we're not out today um, I did the same um, the same um, practical session this year with them and it was I don't know where everybody is but it was the day that Newcastle actually flooded it was monsoonal it was absolutely horrendous and then it's a two-part practical for the second years and the second part of that practical was supposed to be nice weather it was supposed to be nice and balmy and we got out there and it started chucking it down again so I think they're jinxed as a, as a cohort but actually they were brilliant and I think they were really just grateful to be out and they worked really hard despite the conditions. So whilst I think there's some element that they might look at it and go, oh, I don't want to go out. I think they're so keen to actually experience, you know, the marine world that they're, they're just, they'll go out in anything right now, which we should take advantage of. 
which are, uh, David had a good idea. Could you sell your uh, 360 images to generate revenue to pay for the subscription? Not a bad idea. I don't know. <laughs> David, you've got your hand up. Do you want to unmute? Yeah, I was just, it's really cool. I was just thinking, um, I, don't, I don't know what your, your capstone setup's like at Newcastle. I probably should do since I've talked to you a lot all the time. But could you get for one of your finally a project's them to create the content for next year's in a new environment going you know the two of you getting all the all the stuff together is going to be a lot of resource but outsource it as a research project or a capstone project yeah absolutely so we've, we've looked at we've looked at different types of projects for our third years to encapsulate those types of projects absolutely one of the things that we do do with our second year students is we have um internship placements so mm. they go and work with um um, uh, placement providers in industry and one of the things that Sarah and I offer every year is you know the development of um, virtual content resources so you know from field trips that we've done in the past video the videos that we have and how they can bring that together so it's definitely something that we could add into 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 either second or third year for them to develop resources in that way and it'd be great for them to do mm -hmm. yeah cool yeah I just think there's so much scope how you can progress this and you know every time I, I hear you guys speak about this like sort of getting new ideas about where I want to go run with it so uh, let me stop listening to what you keep saying because I've got nothing to work done. I think as well you know the the, the 360 camera um could be a limitation for people but the one that we bought was about 100 quid again it wasn't hugely expensive and it worked really well and it takes those images in about two seconds yeah, and you, you can get all this fancy kit. Like I said, you can get these drones which are invisible to the 360 or like selfie sticks which are invisible so you can actually hold them and take these all these images. It's absolutely brilliant. Do you have any more questions? If anyone, anyone wants to unmute and, and ask, we've got quite a small group. Just to pick up on, on the comment, sorry, from, from Dave in the, the chat about lab use. So yeah, for one of my labs last year, um, it's a practical where students explore organisms that are living on on seaweed so i was able to go into the lab even though the university was sort of closed to students and i had a, an amazing technician help me um, and they recorded me sort of giving an introduction to the session and then recorded me sort of doing the practical or showing the students what they would be doing and then what we did was we sorted through the seaweed um, as if the students were took images of every single organism we found under the microscope and then I used Thin Thing Link to create the practical. So the students had to watch the video. They were um, online. We had a, a Zoom, a synchronous online session. Mm -hmm. So they watched the video in their groups. And then what I did was sort of create a, a Petri dish um, and had the organisms sort of in the Petri dish. So I took a picture of the Petri dish and then put the images in as little tags. So they then had to click on every image. Um, and then they had the key that they would use normally. And they had to go through and identify all the organisms in the images um, and then they could do the practical as they would. Um, so I think there's loads of scope for doing it um, with lab sort of de demonstrations or actually getting them to collect data in the labs as well. And we've done it on our research vessel as well. Um, so we've got really nice <laughs> images of our research vessel um, and our you know, colleagues showing how, how the trawl works and how the grab works. And then there's sort of data sets embedded um, within those, within the, the 360 image that students can can use as if they were on the vessel themselves. I think I might cool. be doing ecology in Newcastle next year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Terry, it's just exactly the same thing. I'm enrolling on that course. As <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, we still had to go out when we did the, rest of the sand dune and the salt marsh days. Um, it was absolutely freezing and absolutely blowing a gale. Um, and Heather was recording me talking and, and we had to do it so many times because all I could hear was the wind um, just sort of battering us as we were stood on the coast. So, yeah. We, Sounds we like a summer job to me. Like. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a summer job. Yeah. That sounds absolutely incredible. Um, and like I said, just so much game. So as you're probably aware, on the uh, Let's Remotely website, we have a series of very short how-to guides. And just wondering whether you'd be prepared to put something together on maybe just using AR, VR, thing links just a one-page guide for anybody that would be interested in getting started and dipping their toe in this. That's yeah, brilliant. absolutely, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we can do that. Yeah. Well, Heather, so thank you very much. Um, what a way to kick off season three.